And all of that brings us to our last video in which we're going to be looking at some high level concepts such as speciation and evolutionary trees or phylogenies. So these are high level concepts for which evolution forms a context and a framework to help us understand them. An important concept I wanted to quickly highlight is the concept of a species. Life can be thought of as a series of hierarchically nested groupings. These were first kind of defined and, uh, and this hierarchy was created by a Swedish gentleman called Linnaeus um, uh, several hundred years ago. Um, so uh, a fine example of this hierarchical um, organization is this cool little creature on the right hand side here. This is a jumping spider that's a member of the species Phidippus regius. So regius defines the species, Phidippus is the genus to which this belongs. So that's its binomial name. Um, I've already mentioned species concepts, we'll, we'll go on to those in, in a bit more detail in the next slide. But this little dude, Phidippus regius, is actually a member of a, of a series of different boxes of cubby holes that each of which includes a slightly greater diversity of life. So in our example, Phidippus regius, this little creature here, is a member of the family Salticidae. These are the jumping spiders, a group of spiders that's defined by a number of characteristics, including these gorgeous eyes on the front here to allow it to jump to, um, to sense distances when it, it jumps on its prey. So that's all good. The Salticidae are a member of the spiders. This is the order Araniae. So as well as jumping spiders, there's a huge diversity of different spider groups um, that make up this order Araniae. There are, for example, many, many more spiders than there are um, mammals, for example. They're a very diverse group. The Araniae as a whole are members of the arachnids. So this is a bigger group the arachnids, that includes spiders, it includes whip spiders, such as Daemon variegatus that I showed you earlier, but it also includes things like mites and ticks, harvestmen, scorpions, all of those are members of a group called the arachnids. And arachnids are just one example of a group, a phylum, called the arthropods. Other members of this phylum include the insects, the um, millipedes and centipedes, which are a, a, another grouping within this, and the crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, and, and wood lice and creatures like that. All of those are examples of groupings within the phylum Arthropoda. And all of those are themselves animalia. They're all animals. And animals are just one example of a group called the eukaryotes. What's the point of this within the concept of evolution? Well, all I'm pointing out really is that evolution scales up through both time and the tree of life. And Linnaeus's system reflects this. While it's imperfect, it is important for classifying life. So just bear that in mind. And the key um, grouping we probably want to consider when we're thinking about evolution in animals and maybe in the fossil record, if that's what we're interested in, are the, sp the species. So with enough time, differences can build up between two populations within a species. Those changes can become noticeable. And at some point, those two pop groups within a population uh, or two populations, say, can no longer interbreed. That is the point at which under many, but not all, species definitions, we would consider those two a different species. This happened, for example, and this is a very good example because it's not an example of a natural speciation, but nevertheless, this did happen when wolves were domesticated. You can see a wolf on the left-hand side here with its dinner. And humans have selectively bred creatures like this, and as we dis will discuss in our exercise over Zoom, um, when we do this, um, this particular workshop, ultimately, that resulted in these fantastic creatures on the right hand side here called chihuahuas. And these two can no longer interbreed. Um, whether it is um, uh, it kind of um, a good idea to think of those as different species, given that humans are responsible for these little dudes, is a, it's an interesting thing we could talk about in this uh, Zoom session if you wanted to. So the important point is, though, that once you um, two things become sufficiently different, they can no longer interbreed. And using the biological species concept, uh, we would then say that those are um, a different species. And this happens in many situations in 
the natural world. And if you choose to do um, either the uh, either the paleobiology pathway or paleontology pathway or EECB next year, in my course on evolution and paleobiology, we'll learn a lot more about the mechanisms by which speciation occurs and kind of um, a whole raft of knowledge surrounding this process in the natural world. So I, I think that will hopefully be very interesting. Oops, sorry about that. So evolution over time can be thought of as a tree, and this is much like your family tree. And like a family tree, it's not a linear process. So we often tend to think about our family tree as looking something like this. We are descended from our parents who are descended from our grandparents, etc., etc. So we think of this as a, a straight line on the way to us, but that's not true. So actually we share um, um, parents with siblings, if we have siblings, and our parents will uh, share ancestors with their siblings etc 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 so that goes all of the way down and just like that um the evolutionary um we can think of um this kind of broad scale evolutionary tree so we have not descended from a fish to a salamander to a cat to us but rather we share a common ancestor with for example all other mammals and those share a common ancestor with other um four-legged vertebrates and so on so uh, an obvi obvious um, extension to this is the statement that humans did not evolve from chimps, right? We share an ancestor with chimps, but we ourselves did not evolve from them. We have a shared evolutionary origin, a common ancestor between those two. And an evolutionary tree like this, like the one you see on the right hand side here, I was pointing to my screen and I realized you can't see my screen, so that's no good at all. Um, this thing here is sometimes called a phylogeny. The field of building these trees is sometimes called phylogenetics. Another word you'll see for something uh, that looks like this is a cladogram for what it's worth. Um, and if we take this to a real example here, we can plot a phylogeny like this. And on the left hand side here, you can see the tree of all life as we currently understand it. As an example, the, the group of single-celled prokaryotes, the archaea, which you've covered earlier in this course, are more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria, the things on the left-hand side of this tree. And that they share a common ancestor. But also, they share a common ancestor with the eukaryotes, so that's the, the group that includes the animals, the fungi, and the plants. So there is a common ancestor that shows that the archaea and the eukaryotes are more closely related to each other than they are in turn to bacteria as a whole. If we look very closely here, you can see the split where animals, fungi and plants are. We don't know right now um, which um, the, the relationships between these three groups. Therefore, they're, they're shown as a thing called a polytomy here. It just means they come down to a single point because we don't actually understand the relationships right now between um, the animals and the plants and fungi on this particular scale of this tree. So you can see another example on the right hand side here. This is a tree of just the animals. This is a different way of drawing an evolutionary tree. It's very, very square, but it means the same thing. So for example, um, we have a group here called the deuterostomes. Um, when I say a group, I actually mean a clade. A clade is a, um, a group of organisms that share a common ancestor. And the deuterostomes are just one example. So chordates that include um, all organisms with backbones um, vertebrates plus a few other things, share a common ancestor with the echinoderms, the uh, starfish and their, their relatives. And that means that they're a clade, and that's a clade that has this name, the deuterostomes. So that is a single grouping on this tree of animals. And this point here shows that they share this common ancestor. So I think that, that's an important primer quickly on just how to read evolutionary trees or phylogenies. So I hope that's useful. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. The implications of this, I think, are really important. And the implications are that everything that is alive is related. Okay? 
So by extension, we can say that there is an unbroken line of living organisms between you sitting right there and the last universal common ancestor of life. And the same is true of everything that is alive at the moment. And that's all drawn from this, the shape of this tree here. Everything eventually shares a common ancestor. These, um, these trees do sometimes fall apart slightly when we have an, a situation where there is, for example, the lateral transfer of genes between organisms that especially happens in bacteria and archaea, they can pick up bits of DNA from other areas. But I think it would overly complicate things if I talked about that now, but I will cover that more in the second year courses. So uh, that's it from these videos, which I hope you found interesting and useful as a tool for you uh, within this uh, this course. Um, in the exercise on uh, Wednesday, we'll be covering uh, some uh, some more details of adaptations in our exercise. But all of it that is left for me to do now in terms of this video is to say goodbye. I look forward to teaching you in person, well, over Zoom on Wednesday. And I hope to see you over the course of your degrees with us. So thank you for your attention so far.